Well, Merry Christmas. It is Christmas Eve and we are so glad to have you with us today. I hope that you are enjoying the holiday with your family. We, of course, are here at Walden Community Church worshiping the Lord and just, we just can't wait. We just can't wait to ring in Christmas. But before we start, before we start, I want you to think about a question, all right, to yourself or if there's people in the room, uh, turn to the person next to you, perhaps. And I want you to think of something that you grew up with, but maybe over the last 10 years or so, it is now gone completely. Like it's, it's gone. Like you remember these things, but in the past 10, 20 years, it went extinct, extinct. You can't find it anymore. Turn to the person next to you or think of it. Did you get something? Something humorous, something funny, could have been something classic from a long time ago, maybe. Uh, you had your laughs. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna give you my top six, all right? These are my top six things that are no longer around. Uh, big phone books. <laughs> Remember that, I mean, there's some, there are some phone books, but the big phone books, gone, right? Because now it's all on the internet. Uh, lickable stamps, gone. There's no, there's no lickable stamps anymore, which is, I think, uh, a good thing. Uh, foldable maps, foldable maps. Now, thanks to MapQuest and GPS and smartphones, those are, those are a thing of the past. Floppy disks, remember, okay, that's farther back than 10 years ago for sure, but hey, that one floppy disk, get this, can hold half a song, half, half, half of a song. Um, cassette tapes. Cassette tapes used to be huge when I was a kid. You know, in 1990, we sold 442 million cassette tapes. And uh, this last year, only 215,000. So they're on their way out. Uh, VCRs and, cassette, and VCR cassettes, just like cassettes that are kind of a, a thing of the past. This Christmas, though, has been a banner year for technology. It seems like you can't turn around. It doesn't matter if they're a, a kid or a teen or even uh, an adult. It seems like we all love technology. And according to the Consumer Electronics Association, 80% of adults, 80%, said that they were gonna purchase some form of technology this year as a gift, 80%. Which goes hand in hand with something else I saw this same week, and that is 10 years from now, 10 years from now, I mean 10 years in the future, your iPhone will be an antique. Antique. The article I saw said that 10 years ago, you would have been blown away by the iPhone and its capabilities. You know, the average memory and storage of a, P of a PC back in 2012, right? But now your phone would blow any 2012 computer away. But 10 years from now into the future, the iPhone will be an antique, or at least the one in your pocket will be an antique. Over the next decade, the evolution of computing devices, the internet, it'll all be faster and everything will be increasingly more intelligent. The 2000s, we saw Google become one of the world's most powerful companies because it helped us get a grip on all the content that was on the web, but now we need a company that doesn't just uh, collect the data, doesn't just organize the data. I think the next Google or Google, you know, if, if, when they, if they decide, they need to find a way to synthesize the data, find a way to bring it all together so that we understand what it means. And there isn't really any way I can harmonize all the information that's out there in the Bible. Uh, I do wanna take a stab though at talking to you about Christmas because hopefully as we see, going forward into the next year, into the next five years, into the next 10 years, my hope is that Christmas is forever because God's love is forever. This holiday season, we've been focusing on joy here at Walden Community Church. I know this time of year is usually busy, it's hurried, it's rushed, it's stressful, but what goes on here? What takes place at church? When I come here, when I come to worship, all of this should be about joy. The world already beats me up. I don't need church to beat me up. The world already tells me that I don't measure up. I don't need church to tell me that also. So when I sing joy to the world, 
I want to mean it, right? I want to mean it. So here we are, the night before Christmas. What do we have to be joyful about? Well, Christmas is all about the gift that God gave us. And everybody likes gifts, especially when there's already a gift on your lap. You know, you haven't opened it yet. And somebody brings another gift out from under the tree and they say, oh my goodness, this one's for you too. That feels really good. <laughs> or when they say, you know what, there's only one gift left under the tree and it's for you. You get the last gift. That feels nice. Let me read the Christmas story from Luke 2. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The first thing we see right here is that God's gift is a personal gift. What do you have to be joyful about? God's gift is personal to you. Those are the best kinds, right? Because a tie is not personal. A cookbook is not personal. A hand mixer or an apron, that's not personal. But when you open a gift and you can tell that that person thought about you, that means a lot. Luke 2 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Several times the angel says, this is, this is for you. And it was. The Lamb of God was for shepherds. Right? The sign of the baby Messiah placed in a sheep trough. That whole thing was an announcement to shepherds. And of course, I understand that the gift of Jesus transcends all times, transcends all culture, but before it can do anything on a global level, the birth of Christ has to do something for me on a personal level. The gift of God will only impact the world after it transforms me and you and then the church. So God's gift is personal, very personal. Second, God's gift is peaceful. It's a peaceful gift. What did the angel say? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Last year probably didn't go the way you wanted. Certainly didn't go the way you expected, did it? Well, what year ever does? There's always bumps in the road. There's always surprises. But that first Christmas, the angels announce a gift of peace. And, and we laugh, you know, sometimes when the kids come up to you and they ask you, they say, Grandma, Grandpa, Mom, Dad, what do you guys want for Christmas? <laughs> right? They say, what do you want for Christmas? And, and they're, they're serious. <laughs> and, and our answer typically is, what, what do I want? I want peace and quiet. <laughs> right? I want peace and quiet. But you know what? I would be fine with just peace from stress, from heartbreak, from bills, from what I have to do tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that. You don't want to live that way. Good news. God doesn't want you to live that way either. Jesus said once in John 16, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, of course, I still stress from time to time. I forget this, right? I forget this. I have worries about the future too. But in those moments, I need to be reminded that God is always in control and that God wants peace for my life. Third, God gives us gifts that fill us with joy. His gift fills us with joy. Again, look at what the angels say. Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. Why does the, re a revival, the, revi the arrival of Jesus, why does the arrival of Jesus bring us joy? Well, have you ever dropped off a pet at a pet sitter? 
like you're gonna go away, you drop off the pet at the pet sitter. Or have you ever dropped your kid off at daycare? Or dropped your kid off in Sunday school class, right? We don't always see it, but the entire time that we are gone doing what we're doing, your kid, your grandkid, your pet is stressing out, right? Where'd they go? When are they coming back? Are they coming back? And so when you do come back, boy, do those little faces light up. Boy, do those tails wag, right? So excited, so happy to see you. Christmas is the arrival of our heavenly parent. The angels called him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So no longer distant, no longer impersonal. God comes to be with us in the trenches of life, with us. He's God in 3D. He's God in real time. Knowing that our Heavenly Father is that close should bring us joy. Fourth, God's gift removes our darkness. It removes our darkness. In Joseph's dream, the angel tells him, she will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Just think, it's a gift that cleans you. It's a gift that removes your stains. It removes your troubled past. It heals your wounds. It wipes out your addictions. I need that kind of gift in my life. And all of it, everything I just mentioned, it's all the same gift. Personal peace, joy, the removal of sin. It's the same gift. It's Jesus. And he was a gift of love. Love has everything to do with Christmas because the best gifts are sent with love. Ultimately, love came at Christmas. You see, just like Christmas gets confused sometimes with commercialism and spending, I think, I think God's gift gets confused, right? Because I think the parent is confusing. I think sometimes we look at God and we are confused. We think God is about judgment, we think God is about anger, wrath. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's not just the world that thinks that way. I think a lot of well-intentioned Christians get it wrong also. You see, we, we get told that God is angry, or that God hates, or that God lives on a distant cloud. God keeps lists. God punishes. But let me share with you a Christmas truth that will change your life. You ready for it? Okay. Here it is. There is not one person listening to my voice right now that is not loved by God. God loves you. He loves you with an out-of-this-world kind of love. And you can't do anything to stop it. You can't do anything to get more of it. And it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter what you're thinking about doing in the future. Because God has this passionate, I love people kind of thing going on. 1 John 4, 9 says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. I'll say it another way, okay? God loves you just the way you are. But he doesn't want you to stay that way. So he sends his son to help you. The feeling of being lost, that feeling of not knowing what to do, that feeling of not knowing which road to take. That feeling that you want to make a difference in your life, but you don't know how. Because you're worried that you're only one person. That's what God wants to help you with. That feeling of not measuring up. That feeling that the world is passing you by and you'll never catch up. That feeling of loss, emptiness, 
unworthiness, that's what God wants to help you with. Look, the phone in your pocket, you'll be lucky if you can get a hundred bucks for it in 10 years. Technology comes and goes, fashion comes and goes, and we'll all be learning a new, new, new math <laughs> 10 years from now. But God's promises and his love last forever. Now I know every other church across the world is probably going to read you the Christmas story. But you know the story. A baby was born, placed in a manger, some shepherds came by empty-handed, some wise men came by, they brought gifts, right? We talk about the Christmas story as if it's the story that matters, that that's the point of Christmas. But they aren't. In fact, Jesus doesn't care if you celebrate Christmas or not. Jesus came to bring love. Jesus came to bring a message of love. Love is the point of Christmas. Love is bigger than Christmas. And I'd rather read you a story about love. Psalm 136 says, Thank God. He deserves your thanks. His love never quits. Thank the God of all gods. His love never quits. Thank the Lord of all lords. His love never quits. Thank the miracle-working God. His love never quits. The God whose skill formed the cosmos, his love never quits. The God who laid out earth on ocean foundations, his love never quits. The God who filled the skies with light, his love never quits. The sun to watch over the day, his love never quits. Moon and stars as guardians of the night, his love never quits. God remembered us when we were down, his love never quits. Rescued us from the trampling boot. His love never quits. Takes care of everyone in time of need. His love never quits. Thank God who did it all. His love never quits. Remember when uh, Tim Tebow was quarterback for the Florida Gators and he was playing in the national championship game? Do you remember that he wrote John 3.16? in the, the black under his eyes. Yep. Amazingly, 90 million people Googled John 3.16 to find out what it meant. 90 million. That means 90 million people did not know this kind of love. John 3.16 is the shortest Christmas story. So I will read it very slowly. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I see two parts to this verse, the gift that is given and the gift that is received. God loved the world so much that he gave his Son. That's the birth of Jesus. That's the gift which brings peace and joy and love. That's why we celebrate Christmas. And the second part says that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. That's the second part of the gift. We believe, therefore we live. But here's the thing. A gift isn't yours until you take it. In the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, one line really stands out to me, and it's born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them a second birth. You ever wondered what that meant? Well, there was a day when we were born, right? When it was our turn, when it was you and me wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a plastic incubator. Well, in addition to our birthday, Jesus told a man once that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So let me ask you a question. Is it easier to give a gift or to receive it? I think it's hard for us to receive gifts, especially uh, as we get older. I think it becomes more awkward as we get older. Well, I think the same is true for receiving a gift from God. We think we have to earn it somehow. We think we have to be worthy of it somehow. 
But John says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, because Christmas becomes Christmas when we receive the Christmas gift that God gives. And all you have to do is receive it. What a great time to receive the gift of salvation. On Christmas Eve, that sweet baby in the manger came to be your savior. He came to be the very first thing you needed. He came to be your gift. And it was the love of God that made that happen. Let me close by asking you one more question. And it's, it's confession time. How many of you have ever received a gift and then given it to somebody else? <laughs> You're like, ah, yeah, that was nice, thank you. And then you turn around and give it to somebody else. That's called re-gifting. I want to encourage you to re-gift Jesus. Not because you didn't like the gift, but because you liked it so much, you want to give it to somebody else. You were given peace. You were given joy. You were given love. Why not re-gift Christ for somebody this season? There's a couple ways you can do that. First, I would suggest we all need to enlarge our circle of friends. Why not let somebody new in to your circle? Maybe even somebody that you've been refusing to let in. Somebody that you just walk by, somebody that you ignore. Step out of your comfort zone, reach out to somebody new next year, and extend your reach of love by enlarging your circle of friends, enlarging your influence. Reach more people. Second, give the gift of forgiveness. <laughs> That's a great gift to receive, you know. Can you think of a better way to re-gift God's forgiveness than to extend that forgiveness to somebody else? Nobody needs a new tie. Nobody needs a cookbook. But I bet your brother-in-law, your dad, your son, they need you. More than anything, give them forgiveness this year. Lastly, I say, love somebody that you don't know. Love people. Love a group of people that you don't know. I think we go through life with blinders on. We always love our own. We love our household. We love our friends. We love our city. We love our state. And we ignore everything and everyone else. Jesus, that baby, grew to be a man. And he told us to love all people. And he went even so far as to say, love your neighbor. He went so far as to say, love your enemy. How are you doing with that? Jesus loved children, even though everybody else ignored them. Jesus loved women, even though they were second-class citizens. Bible records that Jesus healed people, he loved people who were outcasts, who were half-breeds, and he even once healed the servant of a Roman soldier. And he never once used a racial slur. He never told a dirty joke. He never insulted a politician. He never once raised his voice in anger. Instead, he gave his seat away at dinner so that somebody else could have a seat. He chose to sleep outside so that somebody else would have a bed. He made friends with tax collectors and criminals, and he fed those who were hungry, and he healed those who were sick. And this was the love that changed the world. It was that love that caused people to climb a tree just to see him. It was that love that caused people to walk hundreds of miles just to hear him speak. They gathered by the thousands. It was that love that caused spontaneous parades to erupt as he walked by. 
It was that love that spurred a young woman to wash his feet with her tears. May there be love under the Christmas tree for you tomorrow. May there be love and joy for your family. May you find peace from all the worries of tomorrow, and may you receive his forgiveness. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. Let's pray. Dear Lord, before we say Merry Christmas to anyone tomorrow, we want to say Merry Christmas to you right now. Merry Christmas. Thank you so much for Christmas. And even though you never told us to celebrate your son's birth, we do. We celebrate his birth because his birth was the arrival of love, the arrival of joy, the arrival of peace, the arrival of forgiveness, and that has meant so much and touched so many. Lord, as this year comes to a close and we look ahead to next year, we just ask that not just we, but also the church, the global church, becomes a movement in 2023, that we become a force of love and peace, that we find new ways to build bridges, to shake hands, to embrace, and to do the things that you did, to heal, to restore, to mend, to care. Lord, we know that we are imperfect and that we are also broken, but we know that you can restore the whole world. That's what the joy was for everyone who saw that baby in the manger. No one was excited about a baby. They were all excited about a Messiah. It's the Messiah who would rescue, a Messiah who would save. Lord, your world still needs rescuing. And so that means your world still needs Christmas. And as technology fades, as fashions change, may Christmas last forever. May the love of Christmas last forever. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for worshiping with us today on Christmas Eve. Just a reminder, there's no service tomorrow on Christmas Day. I know it's Sunday, but we're encouraging you to stay home with your family. And then next week, we will have two services. We will resume once again our normally scheduled program. Uh, we have a 9.30 service, which is our traditional service. We're gonna sing all the standards. Uh, we have communion, we do responsive readings, we say the Lord's Prayer. It's gonna feel like the church that you grew up with. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service with a worship team. Please come casual, come as you feel comfortable. And that's also the hour where we have our full children's program all the way up to youth group. And we have youth group every Wednesday. Please uh, call or email the church to find out more about our youth group. We would love your children to attend. I love you guys. Merry Christmas. I will see you next year.